Linear pluggable optics, or LPO, is a widely discussed topic over the past two years for its promise of reducing the power consumption and the latency of optical interconnects. There was a lot of LPO-related discussions at OFC 2024 and then at the recent ECOC 24 conference in Frankfurt. Today, we get to hear from Dr. Armand Harpatian, who is the founder and CEO of TerraSignal. So tell us what's next for um, linear pluggable optics. So um, following there was a our lot. Um, announcement back in March at the OFC with our um, TS840102 products uh, at ECOC, we introduced um, a new architecture for making LPO pluggable and also bring diagnostics uh, to LPO. And this new architecture is called TS-Link. Uh, with TS-Link, we're basically able to bring um, two main features to LPO, which has been demanded by a lot of the end customers. Uh, these two features are um, link diagnostics and link training. Um, link diagnost diagnostics are essential because, you know, to manage your network, you basically have uh, to have visibility to all the network elements. And um, LPO, unfortunately, doesn't provide that. It has some rudimentary features like loss of signal and things like that, but you're not able to monitor the BER of the uh, of the link. With the link with the um, TS, we're able to do that. We at, uh, at any time, the um, customer can look at the BER of the link and, you know, decide whether, you know, this the link is going well or it needs to be replaced and so on. So that's the first thing. The second thing, LPO has always uh, been a a non-pluggable module. It's always been an engineered link. So you had to basically characterize the link, uh, figure out exactly what FFE tabs you need to put on the 30s to make this thing work. Uh, with TS links, this, this goes away, it becomes automated. So you're just plugging the module um, and using the CMIS interface, we're able to basically characterize the, the channel. We find the impulse response of the channel, then we find what FFE tabs are needed. Uh, to be programmed in the 30s transmitter so that we get the best PER. And we program that in the TX 30s, um, and then the linker is basically optimized so we get the best PER. And that's done at the startup. So this basically allows um, LPO to become a plug-and-play module, just like a real-time DSP-based uh, optical pluggable module. Um, so these are the two uh, main features that the TS link has added. And so basically what this does is uh, it allows um, an LPO to become a more practical module um, and it able to, so now we're going we're gonna to be able to replace the retime modules and so bring the cost down, bring the price, bring the power down, bring the latency down, which is a very big uh, issue a lot in a lot of this AI and compute applications. Yeah. And also the BER improves because we don't have a slicer at the input of the DSP. We don't have an ADC converter, so there is no quantization noise added to the to the signal. So we think that with this TS link, we will be able to make the LPO a very practical solution, not only for 100 gig per lane, but also for 200 gig per lane and for the future. And so with the with the link training, um, is it something that is done continuously or this is just at the setup one time right. and then you know both yes so it's only done at the setup uh because this channel is not a dynamic channel it's a you know it's a basically there's a chip to module it's a pcb that goes from the asic to the to the module so that channel doesn't change over time there could be some variations because of temperature but those variations are very small and we're able to locally uh correct that with the local CTLD that we have. So we don't have to go back to the 30s to, to change the FAP tab. So the FAP tabs basically are set and they stay this, you know, constant throughout the operation. Uh, the link monitoring can be done at any time. You can uh, measure the BR at any time that you desire. And also okay. one good thing with this uh, is that it doesn't add any power to the module because this is on, done only, uh, and if you look at the duty cycle of this is so low, that doesn't matter how much power it consumes, it just doesn't add to the total consumption. And uh, the modulation that could be working in this environment, is it PAM4? Yeah, so we, we stay with the, we're actually modulation and protocol agnostic. We we can uh, do PAM4, we can do NRZ. What we do is basically going back to the fundamentals and we look at the impulse response of the channel. 
that tells us everything about the channel. It tells us about the ISI, it tells us about the reflection, even crosstalk, we can figure out what it is. And using that information, we are able to program the TXFFE to cancel the ISI and to cancel the reflection. Basically, what we have done here, it's not like there is no DSP here, but we've taken the DSP out of the data path and we put it in the control path. So the data goes through the channel, like an analog channel, but now by bringing the DSP out of the control path, we're not slowing down the signal, but we still have the intelligence that you need to basically do all the equalization that is being done by the DSP, except that information now is being processed in the receiver, and then we program the transmitter to do that equalization, as opposed to go to the A2D and then the receive DS DSP, which burns a lot of power. So it's sort of rearranging the architecture, but it, there's still intelligence in there to provide uh, the information that you need to do the character okay. equalization of the, of the link. What about the performance of these links? So um, we are able to basically do enough uh, equalization to meet the LPO requirements, which is around uh, you know 17 dB of insertion loss and uh, for, for 100 gig. And I believe that's going to be the same for the 200 gig. As long as we can maintain the same type of loss budget, even for 200 gig, we should be able to do 200 gig as well. So sure. 200 gig, we may have to use uh, maybe some uh, flyover cables or bring things closer to the, or shorten the, the distance between uh, the switch and the module. But um, it, this this is a fundamental technology that could be used for 200, 100 gig, 200 gig, 400 gig, anything. It's just, we're looking at the impulse response of the channel, which is the most fundamental characteristic of any channel. And and this work is though directed at those higher expectations, yes. right? 800 yes. gig and 1.62. Exactly. So we're starting with the 89 module. We're going to go to 1.60, uh, hopefully next year. And then let's see what happens next. Okay. And then finally, could you tell us a little bit about the path to deployment, the path to implementation for Terra Signal? Sure. sure. So we, uh, we are working with two module partners. Uh, one is based in the U.S., one is based in China. Uh, uh, they have basically built a module with our uh, uh, device. Uh, there were some bugs that we had to address and we fixed that. And uh, the B0 silicon is, is going to be back anytime this week. And we're going to go to, uh, it's going to be basically shipped directly to the module makers and they're going to start sampling the module to the end customer. So we should be, uh, if all the bugs are gone, then we should be able to uh, ramp up into production early next year. All right. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Sunrun, for the update. All right. You're very welcome.